for that. But um, I wanted to tell you guys all about this plurality project. And um, up here on the slide are some of the people who are making this uh, happen uh, from all around the world, uh, a community of people building this common project. Um, and uh, the symbol for it, uh, which I guess they, they showed over there as well, um, has a lot of things loaded into it. So the word plurality uh, originates from the uh, fact that these two symbols that you can barely see in traditional Mandarin, I don't know if they also have those in kanji, um, but these mean in, in, in uh, Taiwan both plural and digital. And plurality is the attempt to render into English this uh, sort of joining of technology and of social philosophy. Um, and the symbols are also a Unicode character. So you can now have a, an emoji that represents a plurality, uh, which is these overlapping squares. Um, in this detail, you know, one is circle, circles, the other is squares, and they give birth to this rounded square. And plurality is really all about that. Plurality is about cooperation across difference and how by bringing people together across differences we can create uh, beauty and progress and growth. Um, anyway, I won't tell you who all these people are. You probably recognize some of them. Uh, others, hopefully, you'll come to recognize in coming years. Um, OK, next slide. Um, so uh, plurality addresses the fact that technology and democracy are kind of on a collision course right now in most of the world. So you read all over the place about how technology is undermining uh, democratic governments by uh, creating extremism, creating silos and, uh, and divisions and um, polarization and spreading misinformation. And at the same time, I think it's important we also acknowledge that many people in the tech world feel that democracy is also at war with technology. They feel that, um, and with some justice, governments uh, around the uh, democratic world focus overwhelmingly on restricting, uh, regulating, prohibiting uh, the development of certain technologies, and that the government uh, of governments in democratic countries, which used to invest huge amounts of resources in developing technologies, have increasingly left the development of technologies to the private sector. The, the percentage of national income that democratic countries are putting in to uh, technology development has gone way down. And uh, this contrast with authoritarian regimes, which are often building giant cities to accommodate driverless cars, uh, and, and really thinking about the future in this proactive way. Next slide. And our vision is that the reason this is happening is that the two dominant ways of thinking about the future of technology are fundamentally anti-democratic in character. And um, these two visions uh, are kind of both visions of technology and political visions. One of these uh, we call corporate libertarianism, um, and this is associated with people like Mark Andreessen, Peter Thiel, uh, Balaji Srinivasan. It's a vision that is about sort of the individual. Um, it's a vision that's about technology as a way to get around and break down social organization, um, replacing trust with, with algorithms. Um, and you know, its favorite technologies are like the crypto suite of technologies, privacy-oriented things, et cetera. Another vision is what we call synthetic technocracy. Um, these terms, by the way, are derived from the game Civilization VI, which I don't know if any of you have played. It's the best-selling strategy game of all time. And in it, there are future governments. And these are the three future governments. And they were derived from this discussion. So uh, another ideology is, is associated with people like Sam Altman, Reid Hoffman, the AI world, universal basic income, this whole thing. It's like, we're going to make some giant machine. It will do everything for you. And then you can all you know, just party. You know, that's kind of the vision of it. Uh, when I was in uh, college, there was a guy who ran for uh, the president of the student council, the you know, student government. And he said, uh, let the good times roll, keep the good times rolling and the good stuff like alcohol flowing while all the hard work is done by this guy whose name was Smolin. Um, and so the, this is the vision. It's like we all have fun. And the machine manages it, you know? Um, but we think that there is an, another ideology, another vision uh, that is aligned with democracy. Um, 
and that actually underlies more of the technologies we have, things like the internet and personal computers, and many of our main pop cultural visions like Star Trek. But it hasn't been articulated as well as a philosophy. And so we think of these things when we think of the future of technology, and people have been building towards those as a result. And because these are very anti-democratic, they're either hyper-capitalist or hyper-centralized, whereas democracy is about diversity and, and networks and participation, we therefore have gotten into this conflict between democracy and technology. Next slide. But there's a place where that's not what's happening. There's an island, not so far from here, um, where uh, democracy and technology have worked hand in hand, where um, civic technology movement has pushed forward technology development rather than just the private sector or the state where they've used it to have the world's best performance in addressing COVID, to have the most technology intensive economic growth, and in a way that's actually reduced inequality over time and reduced capital share of income. Um, a place where uh, the, the civil se sector has hacked the government and continually upgraded the quality of government services without asking permission from the government to do it. And the government follows and incorporates these things. Um, where they're having the best in the world performance on addressing pollution and the, uh, and the pollution of the information landscape by a large adversary using the involvement of the public and uh, uh, ordinary people. Next slide. And um, this was made uh, possible by, among others, uh, a collaborator of mine, Audrey Tong, uh, the first transgender minister in the world, um, who in the wake of the occupation of their national legislature in 2014, think about that. January 6th in the United States, they came in to the national legislature for three hours. Think of what a trauma that was for the country. These people were 24 times as long, <laughs> uh, more than that, uh, uh, more than 100 times as long. Three weeks they occupied the national legislature how traumatic that was for Taiwan. And yet, using these tools, they found a way to build consensus to get a program articulated and adopted by the opposite party. And then the opposite party brought in the people from this movement as mentors, reverse mentors to the government. And then they were voted out, and she became the digital minister of the country. So that is the sort of social change, social consensus that we can build from moments of trauma if we use these types of tools. Now, obviously, she's been working very hard on the ground doing these things. And she's also tried to articulate them. Next slide. But she articulates more in poetry than in prose. So uh, this is her job description. She said that she wrote for herself, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about the human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us remember the plurality is here. Next slide. But of course, action is amazing, poetry is amazing, but people also need prose. They need things to put their hands on and grab so that they can do and build and extend. And so that's why we're writing this book together, along with hundreds of people around the world, um, Plurality, the Future of Collaborative uh, Technology and Democracy. It will be digitally finalized in March. And thanks to the incredible work of our friend Aki Nori here and many others in the community, will be available. It's already available, many of the ch most of the chapters, uh, to people around the world. And then it will come out in print in uh, traditional Mandarin uh, and simplified Mandarin in June, and in English in June, and hopefully with your help in Japanese not uh, far thereafter. Uh, next slide. Um, so what is plurality? Um, the definition is technology to facilitate collaboration across social difference. So this is very much inspired by this idea from Star Trek. So uh, in Star Trek, uh, the Vulcans, uh, who Audrey very much identifies with, have a philosophy that they call infinite diversity and infinite combination. This is the idea that all truth, beauty, and progress come 
from the union of things that are different. So this is symbolized here by a triangle uniting with a circle and giving birth to a, a diamond of light. Um, and uh, this, to be a little bit more uh, pedantic about it, next slide, um, you can think of this idea as coming from three great thinkers. Um, so Hannah Arendt, one of the great uh, uh, philosophers of the 20th century, used the word plurality in her book, The Human Condition, to represent this idea, that the world is made up of diverse and intersecting social groups, not of individuals and society as a whole. That is, fundamentally, we should think of things in terms of networks, or hypergraphs would be the, the technical way to put it, rather than in terms of you know, isolated individuals and then the society as a whole. Second, Danielle Allen, uh, who I have a paper with that just came out yesterday. I uh, encourage you to take a look at it. It's in the Journal of Democracy. Um, and it, uh, it, she, in her uh, paper on, towards a connected society, built on this idea from Arendt to propose sort of a fundamental idea of political philosophy, which is that the engine driving societies forward is collaboration across social diversity. And that diversity is the fuel for that engine. So what do I mean by this? There, there's actually a very direct and tight analogy here to thermodynamics and how energy actually works. So if you think about what is it that is powerful about oil or about uranium or any of these things, it's that they're in a low entropy state. It's not that they have energy. If everything was just very hot, it would have a lot of energy. That's not powerful. What, what actually does work is when you have things separated. When something's hot here and cold here, when you have something that wants to react, but you stop it from reacting, and then you control the reaction. And of course, whenever that's the case, it's dangerous, right? Uranium can fission, bomb. Oil can explode and burn. But it can also fuel powerful work, right? And diversity, social diversity, is the same thing. That's the key idea behind this. Social diversity, yes, it can cause conflict, it can cause war, it can cause polarization, but it can also produce new things. It can produce innovation and progress and growth. And that is the key idea that Danielle Allen proposed, is that we should think about organizing politics around how do we harness, yes, avoid the explosion, but more importantly, harness for progress social diversity. And finally, what Audrey said in 2016 is that the central role of digital technology should be precisely to facilitate allowing us to do that better. To harness, to, to build the engines of the future, the more efficient engines, the more safe engines of harnessing diversity for progress. Okay, next slide. So, how do we do that? Well, we, there's, there's this powerful analogy between the way that democracies work and the way that operating systems work that we want to draw on. So the basic fundamental idea behind liberal democracy is that there are these fundamental rights that people have that allow for a democracy to exist. If we can't, if you can't know that there are individual people, then how can you have voting, right? If there's no notion of separate people, you can't vote because voting is counting up people, right? So you need to have a notion of personhood and the, the sanctity of the person or there's no way that democracy can exist. You can't without um, people being able to form groups and political parties and associations, people can't act together to achieve things. You can't have democracy without that, right? So democracy is grounded on these fundamental rights. And in the same way, all applications of computers rely on an operating system. That's a common underlying base of code and assumptions that you have to build those applications on and they draw on those things. And if you think about the way that the internet was imagined as the shared set of protocols that we have, fundamentally that's a perfect fusion of the operating system and the idea of rights. 
it's this underlying set of affordances that all of our social interactions in the digital world can rely upon. But so far, that's only for like communication protocols and packet switching and maybe hypertext and things like this. And the vision of the founders of the internet, like JCR Licklider, was that this would extend much further, that this would come to encompass the full sets of things that empower democracy and collaboration across diversity. Identity, technologies of privacy and association, of property and contract and asset sharing in the online world, and of commerce and payments and so forth. And so we believe that the foundation of allowing cooperation across difference in the digital age is to have this much more ambitious vision of what internet protocols are, to build open protocols that are shared and interoperable that empower this richer set of, uh, of properties than we currently built into the internet base layer. And then on top of that, next slide, we can build this broad range of applications of cooperation across difference. So what do I mean by applications? So there's a trade-off inherent in cooperation across difference. Because the deeper you cooperate with someone, the fewer people that that can reach, right? You have the richest, deepest connections with people who are most similar to you, or a, at least a small number of people. And on the other hand, the things that reach the most people are the thinnest, the most basic forms of cooperation. And so one way we can see that is at present, there's this spectrum between like intimacy on the one hand and capitalism on the other hand. Capitalism connects every, almost everyone on the planet. And yet it's very thin. It's like money and these very commercial relationships. And then intimacy is this very, very deep thing. But usually it's just a couple of people who are participating in an intimate relationship, right? And you can, in fact, quantify this. You can think about the number of people who are participating versus the richness of the information they share. So when in, in capitalism, it's like this dollar amount, right, or yen amount, right? So it's a, it's a scalar. Um, voting is more like a vector of opinions you have on different things and in different organizations. Um, then there's structured language, like laws and, and things like this. Natural language in conversation. Um, and then there's unisensory immersion, like you would have if you see like a film. There's multisensory immersion, like if you're at a party. And then there's, you know, proprioception, your internal feeling of yourself. So it, proprioception is the idea, like if you close your eyes and stick out your arm, you know that your arm is out, even though none of your senses tell you that. It's not sight, smell, taste, but it's the internal sense of yourself. And in an intimate relationship, it's that thing that you begin to start to share with someone, right? And what plurality is all about is pushing back the trade-off between these things, allowing us to share more deeply, more broadly reducing that trade-off. And so, for example, it's about making us able to have this type of conversation that I hope we all have, but with many more people. Or it's allowing us to have markets that take into account our social relationships. Or it's allowing us to go from our intimate relationships to ones where we can actually telepathically share with each other using things like brain-computer interface. So all those types of technologies, from the social technologies to you know, brain computer interface, AI, and all these things can be thought of as different points along this spectrum in this goal of pushing out the trade-off between depth and breadth of collaboration. Next slide. Um, and we think that this range of things can transform so many domains of human life. This is, you know, we talk about democracy, but this is about every part of life, not just the public sector. This is about the workplace, how we have remote work that is really connects us uh, powerfully to our teams, how we organize companies in ways that don't have to be hierarchical, but can instead allow people to form networks and collaborate differently. This is about reimagining the media um, by having more powerful ways to empathize with people across difference, by having um, ways of uh, funding the media that support bridging people rather than dividing them. This is about the environment. This is about health. This is about um, the ener energy systems. This is about education and learning. All of 
of these domains, we believe that these technologies can, can help transform. Next slide. Um, and to do that, we need to draw on the lessons that were used to build the ori original internet. We're used to thinking of the private sector as the engine of technological progress. But the internet was built by the support of governments, by the engagement of the civil and academic sector, and with the integration in key scaling roles of the private sector, but not just the private sector driving the whole agenda. And um, that is uh, possible today with work like what Audrey's been doing in Taiwan, with digital ministries collaborating across countries on digital public infrastructure. Um, and to Micah Tilleman, who is one of the top advisors to uh, Vice President Biden, um, when he was vice president, is uh, writing the chapter that we're doing about all these policy issues. And at the same time, it's just announced he's leading one of the largest philanthropic efforts in the world around decentralization, Project Liberty, uh, by Frank McCord in the United States. So next slide. Um, and we need people from all sectors to participate and contribute. We have a Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker is coming to Taipei with us next week to make a movie about Audrey Tong's life and to tell this story to bring it home to people all around the world. There are legislatures around the world implementing quadratic voting to make decisions and resolve their issues. Um, yeah, um, great. And uh, there are um, there are technology uh, companies like Anthropic writing their constitutions using ideas like this. There are academics organizing around this, like Plurality Institute. Next slide. And uh, the book itself is being written in a participatory way. And I hope many of you will join in us in, in doing this. Uh, it's an open public book. It's no copyrights. Everything is on Git. Anyone can make a PR and become part of the community. And all contributions will be credited uh, formally, like in a DAO, but not with money. Instead with community currency that allows you to govern and control the project. Next slide, using something that we call the plural management protocol. And again, I'm running low on time, so I'll skip over this a little bit. Next slide. Um, but uh, I hope many of you will join in that, will contribute to the base text, will contribute to the translation in uh, Japanese that Nishio is uh, leading. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, this uses all kinds of the mechanisms from the book. So we're building the book in a way that illustrates the book's ideas. Many of the book's ideas are going to be illustrated through the way the book is built. Next slide. Um, and so I hope you'll join us. Uh, you can get a link to the website uh, through that QR code. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so yeah, we have.